Welcome to the Heartbreak to Happiness Show with Sarah Davison. If you're struggling with a breakup and you feel shocked, angry, betrayed, devastated, or sad and alone, then this podcast is for you. Best selling author and award winning host Sarah Davison shares how you too can get on with your life to heal, grow, and move from heartbreak to happiness. Here's your host, Sarah Davison. Today, my guest is Dr. Supriya McKenna. Supriya is one of the UK's top experts in the field of narcissism. She started her career as a family doctor and a magazine health writer, and has spent the last few years as an educator, writer, coach, and mentor exclusively in the area of narcissistic relationships. She works directly with those who have fallen victim to narcissistic abuse, including the area of separation and divorce, and regularly trains lawyers and other professionals in how to recognize and manage these personality disorder types. Dr. McKenna is committed to raising awareness of personality disordered individuals in society at large in order to minimize the adverse impact they can have on those around them and to empower victims to break the generational chains of narcissistic abuse. She's the co-author with UK lawyer Karen Walker of two very successful books, Divorcing a Narcissist, The Lure, The Loss and The Law, and Narcissism and Family Law, A Practitioner's Guide. Supriya also hosts a highly popular weekly podcast, Narcissists in Divorce, The Lure, The Loss, and The Law. So I am super excited to welcome Dr. Supriya McKenna to the show. Welcome, Supriya. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my goodness. I am very excited about this episode because this topic is a subject that's very close to my own heart. And I know a lot of my listeners, a lot of my clients are dealing with toxic relationships and what I term difficult exes. Um, The word narcissist, obviously we hear a lot, especially at the moment, it seems to be bandied around, you know, for for lots of different reasons. Can you help us get a little bit of clarity on what is a narcissist? Okay, yeah, I mean, you're right, It, it is bandied around. And what's I think happened in recent years is that we seem to be using the word narcissist as a a sort of adjective to just describe someone who I mean, you you mentioned earlier about people who take selfies, you know, people think that they think a narcissist is someone who takes selfies or a narcissist is someone who's a bit mean or who's a bit selfish or who's a bit vain or, you know, drives a flashy flashy, uh, sports car or, you know, any of those things. And we just kind of use that in normal, normal conversation now. But actually, um, when I talk about narcissism, I'm talking about narcissistic personality disorder. And that is actually a real diagnosable personality disorder. So it's very different to to those other kind of, you know, those other words. Um, And, you know, a narcissist may do a lot of those things, um, but um, equally, a lot of non-narcissists may do a lot of those things. So doing those things doesn't make you a narcissist. Yeah, I think it's so true. I think it is a word that people use (laughs) for for people that take a lot of selfies and all those things. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, people with narcissistic personality disorder may be driving around in sports cars and taking a lot of selfies, but it's not everyone, right? So how common is it, do you think? Um, Well, now figures vary on this one. Um, So um, the range that we hear, um, and it's mostly American studies, is from about 1% of the population through to about 6.2% of the population. That's the, so there's quite a big range in what's being reported. Most experts reckon it's about 5%, so around 1 in 20. Um, uh, so that's a lot, isn't it? I mean, if you consider that you've got one narcissist, now I always sort of think of the narcissist as being like, like um, a son, in their own solar system. So you've got this one narcissist and then you've got all these planets revolving around this sun and in different orbits. So some are really close and then they're getting further and further away. But one narcissist is actually affecting all these different people um, to, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on how close they are to them. So, you know, if you're the primary intimate partner, you're you're in that very close orbit. And then, you know, perhaps you're the sister, so you're a bit further out or the brother, you know, the parent, the friend, the work colleague, 
Um, so you're getting further and further out, you know, the builder, the postman, you know, you know, the, the narcissist affects everybody um, in their orbit. So, yeah, if, it, if it's one in 20, then basically everybody either knows a narcissist, but probably they probably don't realize they know a narcissist or they know someone who is being sort of adversely affected by a narcissist right now. Yeah, I mean, I see this in my clinic, you know, that that people are coming in and I'd say it's between 80 and 100 percent of my clients are dealing with you know, what I call because I'm a coach. I'm not an ologist, iatrist, analyst. So, you know, difficult people, abusive personality types who are causing them a lot of stress and anxiety and heartache and pain. So how do you spot a narcissist you said that a lot of people might be dealing with them but not really realizing what are the common signs that we can look out for well so if I sort of tell you that you know I mean there's there's a long uh, list of diagnostic criteria but um, if I sort of give you a kind of potted version so I think of narcissistic personality disorder as being a condition of low empathy so that's really important um, where they they have a sense of entitlement again that's very important um, and an addiction to feeling special. So those three things, lack of empathy, sense of entitlement, and ad an addiction to feeling special means that they act in ways, they behave in ways to other people, um, which, um, which are abusive basically, but quite subtly so. So they exploit other people. Um, that, so that's kind of the, the small, the potted version really of what narcissism is. But it's really important to understand because this is kind of key to it. Um, that underneath um, whatever sort of um, persona they're putting out to the world, they actually have very, very, very low self-esteem. And actually, someone who's looking out for a narcissist, if you, if you think about it, you'll probably have that sense of they might be very grandiose or they might be, you know, it doesn't matter how they present to the outside world. Underneath it, you'll probably have that sense that this person actually is quite fragile and has a very, a very fragile ego and a very low sense of self-esteem. And actually, that's what lies at the heart of the condition. You sort of have to understand the narcissist to kind of understand, you know, uh, what's going on and why they behave in the ways that they do. Um, so understanding that, going to that sort of um, that very low internal uh, sense of self-esteem, what they do because they can't face that, they don't want to feel that, is that they put out what's known as a false persona. So they project this image to the outside world. And there are various images that they can project to the outside world. There's four major different types um, of narcissists, which I can I can tell you about if, if, if you'd like to know about them. Yes, what, please. Yeah, so, what, so they put out this image to the, full, to, to the outside world. And then what they need is they need other people to kind of believe in this image. So they need external validation from other people. So they kind of, they, they, they make the image real, if you see what I mean. The, the narcissist puts it out there. This is my false persona. Okay, obviously, they don't say that. Um, um, and then the external, they, you know, they get external validation from other people. Um, and, and that allows them to believe in their own false persona. Do you see what I mean? So that they don't have to feel those true feelings of shame and worthlessness and inadequacy and low self-esteem. So it's other people's external validation that keeps their own false persona alive and keeps them feeling OK. So so external validation, which is actually called narcissistic supply, is key. That's why they need attention. They need adoration. And if that if they're not getting that drama will do conflict will do anything that kind of keeps that false persona alive and real to stop them from feeling their own shame and inadequacy so one of the things that um that people sort of notice with narcissists as well is that if if that false persona is injured in some way it's called a narcissistic injury so if perhaps they don't get enough adoration or they don't get enough attention or they're not getting enough drama or conflict they, this false persona is injured and so certainly they're kind of forced to feel their own feelings um, of, of you know those feelings of shame etc and they can't deal with it at all so it, it really feels like a sort of a, an existential crisis for them so they lash out with rage um, and so everybody everybody who's been in a relationship with a narcissist recognizes this narcissistic rage it's kind of almost like one of the only real true it's so deep it's so deeply felt by the narcissist that you think gosh this is you know, this is a real emotion. You sort of realize that everything else was kind of a little bit shallow and that this, this rage, wow, they're really feeling this. 
whoa, you know, I didn't know that they were able to feel quite so deeply. The other emotion that they feel very, very deeply is jealousy. And that will come across as well. Um, so yeah, look out, have they ever been um, full of rage, like really deep rage and, and jealousy? And is it quite a kind of fragile thing? Um, you know, and do you get the sense that they have um, underneath whatever it is that they're putting out to the world? Do they do they have a sense of, do you, do you feel that they've got low self-esteem? So that's, that's something else to look out for. And I've, I've already mentioned the lack of empathy. I mean, that's, you know, that's a key one. And I probably need to tell you that with that, you know, they can feign empathy. But when I'm talking about empathy, I mean um, the ability to step into another person's shoes and actually feel their pain. So actually feel it. So they, they kind of know that, you know, if I was to say to you, oh, you know, my my mother's died. You you know, if you were a narcissist, you'd go, oh, that, that's bad because um, life life experience has told me that's bad. And life experience has told me to say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss, you know but they won't actually feel that sort of pain and they won't, they, so they can't really relate to, to how I'm feeling. And because narcissists can't really feel other people's pain, they can't actually care about them. And that's a, a difficult concept to get your head around when you've, especially when you've been in a relationship with, with, with somebody for, you know, 20 years or whatever, you know, they can't care about you. I mean, that's hurt. Are you struggling to cope with your breakup or divorce? Are you feeling devastated, heartbroken, sad and anxious? If so, please know that you are not alone and there is help available. Sarah Davison, best known as the Divorce Coach, and her team of accredited coaches are here to offer you the support and guidance you need to navigate all areas of your breakup take back your control and start feeling happy again. Sarah will show you how to dial down those controlling negative emotions, unhook from your ex, get back in the driving seat of your life and design a future you are excited to live. Sarah has a range of solutions to support any breakup, including free guides, one-to-one -one coaching, her Heartbreak to Happiness virtual retreats, live retreats, and you can even train to be a breakup and divorce coach with Sarah too. Visit www.saradavison.com today and start to feel happy again. And because narcissists can't really feel other people's pain, they can't actually care about them. And that's a difficult concept to get your head around when you've, especially when you've been in a relationship with, with, with somebody for, you know, 20 years or whatever, you know, they can't care about you. I mean, that hurts like hell for people coming out of these relationships that the person never actually cared about you, no matter what they, they, um, they said at the beginning. The other thing to look out for love bombing. So, you're probably aware, I'm sure, that at the beginning of any, not all narcissistic relationships start with love bombing. And, and what do I mean by love bombing? I mean, it's, it is what it sounds like. They just throw absolute adoration at you. They're the perfect par partner for you. Whatever you, whatever your love languages are, you know, um, whether that be w words of affirmation or, you know, receiving gifts or giving gifts, you know, or, or you know, I mean, I'm sure you you and your clients are all familiar with the, the, the love languages, um, but whatever your particular brand is, you know, um, they, will, they will work out what that is and they will go for it. So they'll spend every wake, waking minute with you if, if it's time that you, you know, and that's the way that you show love or like to receive love, you know, they'll, they'll tell you how wonderful uh, you are if, uh, if it's words of affirmation and they might do all of it, you know, um, they'll get, you know, they'll shower you the gifts, et cetera, et cetera. They'll do whatever it takes. And you think, wow, you know, I have met, I've met my soulmate. Pretty much everybody says that they think they met their soulmate and they felt like they were the luckiest person in the world. Um, you know, wow, I'm the only person that, you know, look, I, I'm, I'm luckier than all my friends, you know, because this person is absolutely perfect for me. And every narcissistic relationship pretty much starts like that. Um, so, you know, you're, you're kind of confused. Yeah. Um, because what happens next after the love bombing is the devalue stage. So there's this kind of cycle. It's called the cycle of idealize and devalue. And again, this is another typical thing for people to look out for. If this cycle is present, then 
pretty much, you know, it's a, it's another sign that they're in a narcissistic relationship. So it starts off with the love bombing, then they, they get put down, you know, so, oh, you know, you sure you should be wearing that top, you know, it shows off your, your arms are a bit sort of flabby and it's all, you know, whatever your insecurities are, they'll pick up on it. Um, and they'll sort of just devalue you just by the smallest amount to start with. I'm only telling you that because I know you want to look good. And, you know, I think you look amazing, but, you know, I don't want other people sort of looking at you funny. I know you wouldn't like that. You know, so they, they'll put it in sort of little ways that are very subtle. And then they'll sort of, you know, they'll, they'll it, the, the devaluations will get bigger and bigger over time. Um, it may even be sort of, you know, name calling, you know, um, silent treatments, um, always being late for you. There are a million ways in which a narcissist can can make you feel like you're not important. Um, and um, so they do that for a bit and you think, oh, no, this is awful. I'm going to try harder. I'm going to do more. I, I want to get back to that amazing love bombing um, stage. I mean, you don't know you're thinking that, but that's what you are thinking, you know, subconsciously. And then suddenly the narcissist kind of pulls out the love bombing again. So you're going round and round in this cycle of being love bombed and then devalued. And it's actually an addictive cycle because it plays havoc with your brain chemicals and it actually literally gets you addicted to the narcissist um, because you're, one minute your, your, your brain chemicals are really high, you know, your dopamine and all those feel good ones. Then they, you know, serotonin, noradrenaline, and then they crash down in the devalue stage and, and you want, you need to get that hit back again, that fix back. So you do everything you can. Then the love bombing comes back again and you're addicted again. So it's a literal addiction. And I mean that a literal addiction to the narcissist. And that's called trauma bonding. So it's a, it's a neurochemical addiction that you get. So if you recognize that as well, that those cycles, and they can be really long cycles, or they can be really short. The devaluations can be really tiny, or they can be really massive. And the love bombing can be just a bit of love bombing, or it can be huge. So it's sort of, you know, if you're in it, you don't really see, you don't think, oh, I'm in the cycle of I do lies and devalue. I mean, you just, you just don't know, do you? You know, it's really, really hard. But if you can step back and kind of think, oh, you know, was there that kind of hot and cold thing going on? You know, was that, you know, that's when people kind of walk on eggshells, you know, during that devalue stage. They don't, you know, they can't bear it. They're trying desperately to please the narcissist and get their love back, you know? So, you know, is that sort of something that was present in the relationship? That's another really big thing to look out for. Um, I'm trying to think, there's so many things. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, goodness, there's so many different things. Like, wow, well, you obviously know so much about this topic. It's fascinating. Just one question you mentioned there that obviously they can't really feel your pain. Yeah. But they yeah. do know that they are causing you pain, right? When, when they are devaluing you in that process. Um, yes. I mean, I think they know they're doing it, but the problem is that they don't care. So they're doing it. Now, I'm not saying they're evil. I want to I want to make that clear. This is a it's a personality disorder that that um, that came from uh, the way that their brains became wired as a result of the way that they were brought up as children to, to, to adverse circumstances. So, you know, I'm not saying, oh, they're evil, nasty people and, you know, um, they should all be shot or whatever. I'm mean, absolutely, you know, I actually have a lot of empathy for narcissists because it, it must be it must be awful to not be able to engage with life um, in the way that, you know, an ordinary person can. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying that, but yes, I think they do know, um, what they, they know what they're doing. They know that they're upsetting you, but they don't care because their primary objective is to get that narcissistic supply from you. And it doesn't matter how they get it. So, you know, they don't know that they're doing it. Actually, they don't, they don't know that they're, so they don't know that they're abusing you. They know that you're upset. They know that you're upsetting you, that they're upsetting you, but they don't know that this is abuse all they're doing they're being driven by programs which you know we don't understand really as as ordinary people um you know um unless we sort of get into it in the way that that i have sort of thing but you know um so that they're they're doing it in order to get narcissistic supply because their primary aim is to keep that false persona up so that they don't have to feel that awful awful feeling of of, of nothingness of shame and, and 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 worthlessness so that's actually that's their primary motivation and if there's fallout um, you know, it, it doesn't matter. And they want to keep you in play. 
So once they've got you, they want to keep you in place. So they're not, they don't behave so badly towards you that you go, right, I'm off. This is, you know, that wouldn't work. They need to keep you in play. So that's why they engage in this cycle of abuse um, because that keeps you there so that you yeah. can, essentially, they can feed off you for that narcissistic supply. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting because, I mean, as a, you know, as many people listening to this will be thinking, well, it feels maybe not evil, but definitely cruel. You know, some of the behaviours can be very, very cruel as a, as a victim. And, and I, you know, at times it can appear that they, you know, they can see the result of you being very upset and they're keeping going and they're continuing, even though maybe you flagged it up. But I, I mean, all to, I mean, it sounds horrific, doesn't it? I mean, to be in a relationship with somebody who has a personality disorder like this, you know, it is, a, a, an emotional roller coaster that you're strapped into in that kind of game, you, you know, you're in play, as you said. So, what type of people are attracted to these relationships? Because so from the outside, people listening in who've never been in that relationship would think, oh my goodness, you know, why would anyone get into that? And I understand the love bombing can suck you in, but is there a type of person that is more attracted to these relationships? that's it for today's episode to listen to the second part of my interview with dr supriya mckenna please check out my next episode that's it for today's episode of heartbreak to happiness don't forget to subscribe and leave a review to win a free ticket to one of sarah's virtual retreats the retreats are a transformative combination of live webinars with Sara herself, coupled with empowering online video programs designed to help you cope better with your breakup and start feeling happy again. For more details, head on over to heartbreaktohappinesspodcast.com, where you can also get a copy of Sara's free gift. Thank you and join us again on the next episode for another dose of Heartbreak to Happiness.